Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Attacks when defending the Word of God, Christmas conclusion. Okay. My conclusion, I just want to do a video and touch on a few things that God's put on my heart. Um, we could make more videos and more videos. I wanted to do this outside, but it's hailing and raining a lot still here. So, uh, to stay away from Christmas and pagan holidays, that's the ultimate conclusion. conclusion okay, is stay away from evil. Stay away from wickedness. Stay away from sin. Okay? And that, brothers and sisters in Christ, the studies that we've done, we've talked about how they try to use liberty as an excuse and attack us with liberty. Oh, we have liberty, we have liberty. Uh, Christmas doesn't apply to liberty unless you're claiming it's a sin. And even then, it only, claims, it only applies to liberty if someone's bringing in salvation, bringing your salvation into question based off of one sin. You've sinned that one sin that caused you to lose your salvation. Then it becomes a liberty of you if you're admitting that it's, it's a sin. If you're not admitting that it's, a sin, that it's not a sin, then it doesn't apply to liberty at all. And we've proven this time and time again. Why? Because we went to the next study where we talked about one day above another. What's the one day above another? It's a day unto the Lord. And you compare scripture with scripture with scripture, you find out it has to do with holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon. It has to do with the Levitical laws. That's that one day that's above another. If you compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. If you refuse, and just flat out refuse to compare Scripture with Scripture, then to you, that one day is any day. And we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. And then our last video where we actually just really put it right in front of the brethren's face, Brother and Sister Christ, saying, okay, here's the birth of Jesus Christ, the day of Jesus' birth. Here's the pagan practices of Christmas. You need to choose. You gotta choose between the two. You can't have both. You can't serve two masters. And, and there's still brethren out there that I believe are saved. They're still gonna vehemently try to choose both and try to choose both because they try to ser serve two masters. But ultimately, brothers and sisters in Christ, stop causing division. Okay? And you say, well, you're the one. No, I'm not the one causing division. I'm causing unity. This is our foundation. Okay, brother says Christ, this is our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. This is the final authority. Jesus Christ will always, always, no matter what, even if it's something you believe that you have a choice, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Even when something like that comes up, Jesus Christ is still your final authority. And we read scriptures on it, proving it. That even the man's heart plans his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. You remember that over in Proverbs? Man's heart plans his own way, but the Lord directs his steps. The Lord will always, if you're truly saved and born again, the Lord will always be your final authority through his perfect written word. This is the final authority. I'm preaching unity. I'm preaching that we all need to come together and be of one mind, one body. Okay? The brethren that are vehemently standing for Christmas and making videos, perverting the Word of God, trying to justify Christmas and appealing to people's flesh, feelings, and opinions, they're the ones causing division. Okay? So my advice to those brethren is to stop causing division. Okay? It's one of those things that one of Satan's tricks is, is they'll be causing division and they'll turn around and tell you to, and, and start yelling at everybody else, stop causing division. Okay. They're pulling people away from the Bible, but then they'll turn around and tell everybody, stop pulling people away from the Bible. It's one of the tricks that Satan always uses. He'll be, you'll have someone that's so prideful that they'll yell at everybody, you need to humble yourselves, you need to humble yourselves. Why? They're prideful. That's how they try to hide how they are. They're the complete opposite of what they're preaching. <laughs> Be careful about that. Okay. So some of the subjects that I want to talk about. Okay. I just want to go over briefly the three studies that we did. They can't use liberty, brothers and sisters of Christ. They're going to try to use liberty, and they're going to try to get you messed up by going off feelings and opinions, and not going off the scriptures. I've shown through the scriptures what true liberty is. Okay. Go watch the studies if you haven't. But my liberty studies, the three studies I just did recently, attacks when defending the word of God. One of them when it came to Christmas, was liberty. And it's not just Christmas. A lot of people try to hide all kinds of sin under liberty. It's not just hiding Christmas, the pagan holidays. They try to hide all kinds of things under liberty. 
Two, the one day. All they don't care about the one day. They turn the one day instead of it being unto the Lord and the Lord being the authority of what pleases Him and what's considered unto the Lord. God's not the authority anymore. And it's not unto the Lord. It's just any day. They change the one day to any day. And that's dangerous. I, mean, I got brethren that I highly... That, that I, I love and respect that used to be comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, and now the Scriptures just get thrown out, and it's about feelings and opinions. They no longer... Bible readings, not Bible studies, it just becomes Bible readings. What happened to the Bible studies? What happened to comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture? Okay. And then we actually compared... I want to go over it again. We actually compared the birth of Jesus Christ, the day of His birth, to all these pagan practices that come along with Christmas. We divided it to show that it has no basis in Scripture. So when someone claims, oh, Christmas was Christian at one time and the lost world perverted it, they can now be shown to be liars and deceivers. Christmas was never Christian. It was never biblical. But the one of the things, because I'm, I'm just doing a quick run over on a few things, because I could make video after video after video, but at this point, if you stand there, I had one of the comments in the comment section said, I've watched your videos, and i watched Brian's videos, and I don't, you haven't proved your point, and Brother Brian hasn't put, at this point, after showing all the evidence of, hey, this is our final authority, and pushing you to use this as the final authority, if you still vehemently defend Christmas, you got a problem. You got a serious, serious problem. And your problem is with this, the Word of God. Not with me. With the Word of God. A lot of people have attacked me in the comment sections, and all they do is yell at me and try to tear me down and make fun of me and, and hold past sins against me and make up, uh, make up stuff, lies, all kinds of, just anything to attack me personally because they can't use this. Why? Because this is not on their side. It's not about this being right, it's about this being right. And that's what I've always pushed for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, this being right. Make sure you stand for the Word of God. Make sure you're staying in your studies and reading it. Make sure you know this book. I'm going off, I'm going off my notes a little bit, but the Bible talks about the good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. When I was first saved, brothers and sisters of Christ, I was simple. Why? Because I was just starting out. God had a lot of cleaning up to do, sanctification. I was just learning what 2 Timothy 2.15 meant. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study, study, study. I didn't know this book that well. I was newly saved. I was simple. But as I grew in the Lord, and Him and me, and He opened this book to me, and you stay in this book, and you study this book, you are no longer simple. I'm not saying you still can't be deceived. It's, it's just a lot harder for them to come along with good words and fair speeches to deceive you if you know the book. If you keep putting this book down and letting it gather dust and you just go off of what people say and be respecter of persons, what happens? You're gonna, you become simple again and it's easy to deceive you. With good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. I've always pushed, this is our final authority, brothers and sisters Christ. And there's some brethren that are taking the authority away from the Lord and putting it in their own hands. And I've said this before, if final authority was in my hands, this world would be in a big mess. My walk, my life as a Christian would be just the biggest mess in the world. Why? Because it's, the authority isn't in my hands. The authority is in God's hands. Where it belongs. Okay? So I can make video after video after video, but one thing I want to mention is my Jeremiah 10 study where I put uh, a tree decked with gold and silver. I stand by my teaching, and I warn the brethren to be careful when you have brethren come out, or false brethren, because um, you have the lost world always trying to defend wickedness too. But even when you have brethren come out, make sure to be careful that they're not adding to or subtracting from Scripture. Okay. And one of the things that they were yelling out recently, one of the brothers was yelling out about Jeremiah 10, one of the things he was yelling about, it's not written to Christians, it's written to the Jews, it's not written to Christians. And you know what? That brother's 100% right. It's not written to us. But one thing he probably didn't mention was is that it's written for us. 
Turn to Romans, if you got your Bibles, your King James Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So it was written for us? Yeah. Was it written to us? No. But was it written for us? Yeah. Could we learn something from it? Yeah. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That we might have hope. There's things that they made mistakes in the past that will save us from making the same mistakes today. We can learn from it. Instruction and righteousness. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. We're just going to read the first four chapters. Or four chapters, not four chapters. First four verses. And like I said, we did the whole study on it. And we talked about groves, high places, the Jewish people. We actually expounded more on what led up to this. Okay? I got this study about high places or church buildings. Okay, and we talked about groves in that one. Okay. But Jeremiah chapter 10, it says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you. That's so important where it says, Hear ye the word. Because we have brethren that come in, they try to change the word to suit their agendas. If you could change the word of God, brother and sister Christ, you can make it say whatever you want it to say. Be very careful. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathens. Could that be applied today for instruction in righteousness? Oh yeah. Learn not the way of the heathens. This whole thing about Christmas, or Halloween, or Easter, the ways of the world, the rudiments of the world, the traditions of men, culture, heritage, Learn not the way of the heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. What goes on top of a Christmas tree? Five-pointed star. What are stars in the Bible? Angels. What else do they put on top of Christmas trees? Angels with wings. Verse 3. For the customs of the people are Vain. Can we learn from that? That oh, there's, it's just a custom. It's just a custom. Does it go against the word of God? Well, yeah, go. We've proven it. Yeah, we've proven it goes against the word of God. Then that custom is vain. For one cutteth the tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workman with the axe. Now be careful. Some brethren like to change the workman to craftsman. No, the Bible word is workman. And it says, with the axe. Oh, no, no, it, it, it's like carving tools, because they're carving and they're turning it into a statue and everything. Be very careful, brothers and sisters of Christ. It says, for one cutteth the tree out of the forest, and then it explains how they cut the tree out of the forest. With the, workman, or work, with the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. They used axe to cut the tree down. doesn't talk about craftsmen. doesn't talk about, you know, turning it into something else, other than it's a tree cut down. Now, as we're going to get into this, I'm going to be honest with you. Verse 4. They deck it. Deck it. Not gilded. Decked. You have brethren coming in, they don't like that pesty word decked. Why? Because what do you hear in Christmas? Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Ba la 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 la. La la la. Puke. Yeah. So, decked is so used in the word, used around Christmas time, we got to change that pesky word deck. So, what are we going to change that word deck to? We're going to change it to gilded. So, we change the word of God from, work of the, from the work of the hands of the workman to craftsman, and now we're going to change the word deck to gilded. They deck it with silver and with gold, they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. Okay, the word decked means to cover, to adorn. That's what decked means. Okay, could cover mean gilded? I'm not going to throw it out there, but the thing is, is I'm not going to try to replace the word of God with my own word to try to make me right. The word is decked. Part of decking is your covering, whether it's just throwing something over it or actually stapling something down onto it. Okay, but we know it's silver and gold. Okay, they're decking a tree. It doesn't say anything about craftsmen. It doesn't say anything about turning it into statues or anything like that. And like I said, we talk about in our past studies how you go back to the groves. They were trees. 
The groves in the past, in the Old Testament, were trees that they would adorn, deck. They'd put a false god on top, and they'd put gift offerings underneath. The high places, uh, we talked about this, the king built two um, calves of gold and put them in two different cities to prevent the Jewish people from going back to Jerusalem, and those were the two high places. Okay, but then when the Bible talks about groves, groves were areas where they had uh, trees that they would deck. They put a false god on top, and they put their gift offerings underneath. Okay. But the point I'm pointing out here, brothers and sisters, be very careful. Don't let someone deceive you by changing the word of God. If you change this to craftsmen, workmen to craftsmen, and you change the word with the axe, oh, it's not with the axe, it's with tools. You know, carving out and everything and turning it into a statue. When you change the Word of God, you can make it say whatever you want. And the Bible talks about turning the Word of God into a lie. And serving the creature more than the Creator. You start falling into the heathen ways. What does it say? Learn not the way of the heathen. I stand by my teaching on this. What's going on here? We can learn from it today. Things that are written before time are written for our learning. What's going on today? They're going back to their heathen way, to the heathens, the Jewish people. For us today, it's us going back to our old lives, the heathen ways, bringing in the heathen ways, and we're putting aside God's ways. Okay, we're supposed to do things God's way, but I'm going to put that to the side, and I'm inviting the heathen practices in, like Christmas. The heathen practices. What's going on here? You have idols. They're creating idols. They took a tree from its natural state that God created it and they turned it into an idol. What do you do with the Christmas tree? You take it from its natural state and you turn it into an idol and you put it in your living room in the most prominent place so everybody can see it. It becomes an idol. It's not the same thing as taking wood and turning it into a table or building a home or something. You turned it into an idol. It's only there to be looked at and go, Oh, ooh, it's so pretty. It's an idol. That's all the Christmas tree is. It's an idol. It's no different from what they were doing here. But you have brethren out there that are trying to deceive you. Be very, very careful. We can learn from their mistake. Learn not the way of the heathens. For their custom of the people are vain. They deck it with silver and gold and fasten it with nails and hammer that it move not. And one of the things they talk about in here is it's speaking. Uh, there's a lot of idols that don't look like people that they believe speak to them. You have obelisks. Okay? There's all kinds of idols. Not all idols have to be a statue of a person. Not all idols have to be like that. Okay? If anybody tells you that, they're lying. They're trying to deceive you. Just because they said it, it speaks not. They don't speak. I speak to you guys like I'm speaking to you, but those trees, they don't speak. Why are you praying to these trees? Why are you praying to these false idols? You say, well, we don't pray. Do you pray around the Christmas tree? Well, yeah, we pray on. Exactly. Now, I'm not going to go into it too much. We've got studies on it, but I just want to hit that again to say, hey, be very careful. People will use good words and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. And if you know your Bible, you won't be deceived as easily. You start comparing the scriptures, you start looking, okay, they didn't kick out the heathens like they were supposed to, and God said that they would be a snare unto them, both physically and spiritually, I believe. It's talking about both, where their gods will be a snare to them, false gods, lowercase g gods, and they'd also be a physical snare because they're always fighting with the Philistines if you read the Bible and everything. Then you learn about the groves. Then you learn about the high places, why they're there, how they would invite false practices of God's in. You study the Word of God, it's going to be hard for someone to sneak in and say, it's gilded. Uh, no, the Bible word's decked, not gilded. Why did you change the Word of God into a lie? It doesn't say gilded. Oh, it's a craftsman, it's a craftsman. It doesn't say craftsman. It says with the workmen with the axe, it's talking about how they cut the tree down. Not what they did with the tree afterwards. That comes in at verse 4. 4 is what they did with the tree after they cut it down. They decked it with silver and with gold. And like I said, deck means covered. Could they have hammered? Could they have turned it into a statue? 
But it sounds a lot like a Christmas tree, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds, but it's, it's an idol. It's an idol. That's what matters. It's, it's an idol. What's the Christmas tree? An idol. There's no difference between the two. It's false gods. And like I said before, you've got brethren complaining about spiritual attacks, and you ask them, have you checked your house out? Do you make sure, like, with me, Brother says Christ, I was looking around, I had my little stand over here, you can't see it, but it has all this trinkets and stuff that I, uh, not trinkets, but little things that I gathered from around the world on my travels all over the world. If I told you all the places I've been, you'd be like, wow, you've been around the world? Yeah, I've been around the world. Okay, I've seen some things. But as, as I was walking past this one day, I looked at it, and there was a plate. And it had two dogs on it. And it was from uh, Okinawa, Japan. And when, it comes, when you actually look into the, the, the thing about the two dogs, they're actually demons. They even admit these are two demons that we put outside our house, that ward our house, and protect us from demons. So you put demons on your property to protect you from demons. That really makes a lot of sense. But the lost world never does make much sense. But the point is, is when it felt like I was on spiritual attack, it's because I still had evil and wicked things in my house that needed to go. And I got, brother, oh, I just, around this, around this holidays and everything, it just seems like we're really under spiritual attack. And you ask him, do you celebrate Christmas? Oh, yeah. Do you put a Christmas tree in your house? Oh, yeah. You're inviting devils in. Demons. False gods. Why do you think you're under spiritual attack? Hello? And we say that, and we do this out of love. I'm trying not to be sarcastic. When I said hello, that's sarcastic. Please forgive me. We're trying to warn you. Why do you think you're under spiritual attack? Okay, when you invite Satan into your home, and someone points out to you, when once God pointed that out to me and said, that was wickedness, I destroyed that plate. I broke it. It had silver and gold on it. <laughs> kind of like what we're talking here. It had actual silver and gold on it. I broke it into a million pieces and threw it away in the garbage. I don't want Satanism in my home. I don't want false gods in my home. I don't want things that don't please God in my home. And what do you do with Christmas when you invite a Christmas tree in your home and all the pagan practices that go along with Christmas? You're inviting things that A, don't please the Lord. It's all about you and we prove that. And you're inviting evil spirits in. You're saying, Satan, come right on in. And then, you, and then you have brethren that complain and whine about uh, being spirit, under spiritual attack. Well, stop inviting Satan in. The Bible says, resist the devil and he, must, and he must flee. But if you're just setting up a Christmas tree, some idols, and God shows you that's an idol, and he has, you're inviting him in. You're not resisting the devil. You're inviting him right on in. Come on in. Okay. So, when it comes to Jeremiah 10, I'm keeping my study up there because I still believe that this is for us today. What was written before time is written for our learning, that we might have hope. That's a false god. That's the heathen way. When I got born again, I got adopted into a new family. My heathen heritages are gone. I'm adopted into a new family. God's family. I now can be called the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. I'm a child of God now. Just like the Jews were. I've been adopted in. I have a new family. The ways of the heathen need to go. The ways of the world, the rudiments of the world, traditions of men that go against Scripture, they need to go. They need to go. A lot of brethren have talked about that, where they've, God has helped them get a lot of stuff out of their life, and one of the things is their heathen heritages and pasts got them out. So now they do things God's way. They don't do things their heathen ways. So be very careful when someone, because when someone starts changing, once again, just for that study, Jeremiah 10, when someone starts changing the words that God has chosen, they can really mess you up if you f f go along with it. Oh, it, it sounded good, it sounded good. You can make the Bible sound any way you want. But the point is, is they took a tree from its natural state, turned it into a false idol, false gods, and it was the heathen way. They went back to the heathen way. They weren't standing for God's way. What is Christmas? Going back to the heathen way. What is a Christmas tree? A false god. Period. Now what do you do with that? You are not ignorant. God's holding you accountable. What do you do with it? 
But one of the things that I want to do a huge study on, and if you want me to do a huge study on it, let me know in the, in the, in the um, comment section, and I will. But what happens is when you have the lost world, when they're trying to preach something that doesn't, the Bible is against them. And there's no way they can get this Bible to say Christmas is okay. There's no way they can get this Bible to say video games, Hollywood movies, and TV shows, and anime, and satanic style music, getting drunk, getting high, uh, fornication, uh, bad language, whatever. When they can't get this to say what they want to do, what they end up doing is, is they start appealing to the flesh to get you to put down the Bible. They start appealing to your flesh to get you to ignore the words of God to get you to side with them. They'll start appealing to the flesh. 1 Kings 12, 28. We'll talk about it. I forgot how to put this down. So give me a second. We put this down here. Appealing to the flesh to get you to put down your Bible. 1 Kings 12, 8, 28. Where is there a situation where someone appealed to their flesh to get them not to obey God's word and do things God's way, but got them to do things the world's way, the wrong way. 1 Kings 12, 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is, so, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's just too much hard work for you to do things God's way. And it's not that fun. I mean, come on. I mean, just sitting there by the fire and reading the birth of Jesus Christ the day of his birth, or what happened before, the day and after, that's just not fun. But let me show you a funner way to do things, a better way to do things, like the Christmas tree, Christmas lights, Christmas gifts, Christmas dinners, Christmas social gatherings, Christmas this, Christmas that, on and on. Yeah, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. So this was your high places. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he, why, why is this sin? Because they're supposed to go to Jerusalem. Every year, everybody's supposed to make a trek to Jerusalem. All the Jewish people. And it's going to get back to that way in the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, too. They're going to get back to having to trek, make a trek every year to pay respect to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But even to Dan, and he made a house of high places and made priests of lowest of the people. The priests were supposed to be the Levites. But here we're going to put, we're going to make our own priests and make them look cool and everything and, and worldly and, and exciting and, and pleasing to the eye which are not of the sons of Levi not the sons of Levi and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month a feast he's playing to the flesh to the eyes those calves ooh, ah, gold now there's no silver but what we were talking about Christmas tree ooh, ah, gold and silver decked with gold and silver ooh, ah, to the eyes for day to feast the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered up the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. He made up a day for himself. Kind of like December 25th. Out of his own heart, it's man's heart. It's not God. Somebody else came up with December 25th. And ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And ordained a feast. Another feast. Come on. Let's go. Feast, feast, feast. Fun, fun, fun. Flesh, 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 flesh. Children of Israel. And he offered up the altar and burnt incense. And if you go back to our study where we talk about high places versus church buildings, they used music. They had music, they did things that appealed to the flesh, things that appealed to the eye, that were pleasant to the eye. Yeah. So, brothers and Christ, when people get so desperate that this, they'll start appealing to feelings and opinions. Um, 
They'll try to show, like showing a man burning a Bible, the King James Bible, over Christmas. Uh, that's flesh. That's trying to get a rise out of you. That is not the final authority. This is the final authority. I'm telling you about the way your child, when his eyes light up when he opens his gift, and you know he's opened his gift for Christmas, and oh, it's a, it's a video game system, and, and he hooks it up to the TV and he plays it, oh, it's just, just to see his eyes light up. Some of you are going, what, video games are bad? I ain't going to buy my child. Nobody should buy their child. But see how it went south really fast when you did obvious sin? But they'll tell you when their eyes light up when they open a gift. That's called appealing to the flesh and getting you away from the Word of God. When they try to talk about memories, memories. Yeah, the past. Okay, I got memories too. I remember talking about one of our studies, but it's I was like, I used to celebrate Halloween as a professing Christian family, growing up as a, in a professing Christian family. I would dress up as a werewolf, and it took some time to do it. And all all these memories of laughing with my grandma and talking with my grandma, because she, you see what I'm saying? Is that the final authority? Memories, fond memories, all these fond memories of the past of me doing sinful, wicked things. No. This is. How do you get people to put this down? When you get them to go off of the flesh, when you get them to start going off feelings and opinions and, and fond memories and this and that, that's all flesh based. It appeals to the flesh. How do you think uh, the Catholic Church who created Christmas got the whole world to celebrate Christmas? Christ Mass, Christmas. How do you think they did it? Did they do it by just telling them, hey, you guys sit there and be quiet all day and sit there and observe Christ Mass? No, they threw in all this fleshly stuff that appeals to the flesh. And they only get Catholics to do it. They've gotten the lost world to celebrate Christmas, Christ Mass. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. We'll be talking about this more in another study when we go through Colossians. Two, but why is it a stumbling block for the Jews? Because to the Jews, the gospel as it, as it is, they need laws. They need signs. They need the visual. They need that pleasing of the eye. They need the flesh. They need to be, to be told to keep the laws, to keep the laws in order to be saved. They can't handle what, repent and believe in Jesus Christ, that's it? Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you? That's all I have to do? No, 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 I have to keep the law somehow. i got to keep the law somehow. That's why it's a stumbling block for the Jewish people. But why is it, a stumbly, uh, why is it foolishness to the Gentiles? What? You just serve one God? There's just one God? <laughs> We've got many gods. You just have your one God. We have tons of gods. We've got the three gods of the Trinity. We've got the gods, sun gods of Christmas. We've got the sun gods of Easter. We've got gods, 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 plural. That's why it's foolishness to them. You, you just worship one God? That's so foolish. That's so foolish. And the Bible warns with the Gentiles, we've got to get past that. There's only one capital G God, and that's Jesus Christ, who is God the Father. Colossians 2.6 we read, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, Salvation, true salvation. So walk ye in him. Walk ye in him. We talk about Romans 8 where it talks about are you uh, carnally minded, walking after the flesh? That's lost people. You're not supposed to be doing that as a saved person. A saved person is spiritually, capital S, spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. So walk ye in him. You're walking in Jesus Christ. He tells you what to do. He tells you what pleases Him and what doesn't please Him. This is the final authority. Okay. Rooted and built up in Him. Like I said, when I was first saved, I was simple. I'm not that simple man anymore. Can I still be deceived? Can I still make some mistakes today? I pray to the Lord to always keep my eyes open. That's why we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God every day. We're supposed to stay in this book every day. We're supposed to pray every day. Okay, and he gives us warnings and warns us how to deter see wolves in sheep's clothing, 
how to, to spot out these people with good words and fair speeches. We're built up in Him. Over time, God will build you up and make you a strong Christian in His Word. And you're not going to be that simple man anymore. And established in the faith. Yeah. When I was newly saved, uh, people, that's the number one person that people, that the ministers of Satan, false converts that come in, wolves, sheep's clothing, the number one people they go after is newly saved people. They don't go after people that have been saved for years and years and years as much because they're established in the faith. They go after the new ones, the babes in Christ. And we're supposed to be protecting them, not being part of the deception. We're supposed to be keeping them on the straight and narrow, not telling them to go off the path and start going back into the rudiments of the world, traditions of men, culture, heritage, all that. We're supposed to keep them on the straight path, the straight and narrow. As ye have been taught. A brother once, Christ once said that when it comes to doing things for the Lord and living a life of Christ, if it's not in here, you shouldn't be doing it. Shouldn't be doing it. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Always giving God thanks in all things. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. When philosophy and vain deceit come in to get you to go after the traditions of men and rudiments of the world, it's always going to lead you back to false gods, plural, worship. Elevating the flesh and going back to the gods of this world, whom the God, the lowercase she God of this world, have blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. You got saved, so Satan's going to try to keep pulling you back into the world. You have brethren that are taking off that helmet, the hope of salvation. They're supposed to be keeping their eyes on Jesus Christ every day and say, Jesus Christ can come back any day now. What have I done for the Lord today? Am I giving God thanks in everything? Am I giving Him glory in everything? Am I doing things that please Him? Am I reading my Bible every day? Did I read my Bible this morning? Yep, I did. Praise the Lord. Am I, do, am I reading my Bible every night before bed? All right. Singing some hymns, the things that I do with my hands, the work with my hands, are they things that please God? you got brethren that have taken off their helmet, they're no longer looking for the coming of Jesus Christ, the imminent return of Jesus Christ. The whole point of looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now isn't the fact that He could come back any day now. We look for Him to come back any day now because it has to do with the life that you're living. You're not supposed to just sit here and do nothing and say, Oh, He's coming back tomorrow, so I don't have to do nothing. That's a lie. If you actually believe Jesus is coming back tomorrow, what are you going to get done for him today? He, I, I still want to get some stuff done for him. I've got to get this done for him. I want to do this for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to do that. For, well, I still haven't got that out of my life. I need to get that out of my life. He's coming back any day now. That's someone who's truly living for Jesus Christ. And I've seen brethren that used to be like that, and they, used, they would live hardcore for Jesus Christ, and now they've taken off their helmet and hope for salvation. And they're no longer looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now. No, nah, he's not coming back for five or ten years. And it reflects in their life that they're living for the Lord. It shows. Oh boy, does it ever show. So brothers and sisters in Christ, be very careful when people are trying to appeal to the flesh to get you to put down your Bible. Be very careful. This is the final authority. Watch out for people trying to change the Word of God. Add to or subtract. Watch out for people who don't all of a sudden don't want to do a, a hardcore comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture studies like they used to. Be very careful. And be very careful when they start appealing to the flesh. Be very careful. Right. Now, we've talked about this before, but I want to bring it up again. Willingly to sacrifice brethren on the altar of the flesh. I guess that's the best way to say it, because I say on the altar of Christmas because that's what we're talking about. But it can be used for anything that has to do with the worldliness, the rudiments of the world, the ways of the world. You're sacrificing fellowship with the brethren over something that is worthless. It all decays and dies. It's worthless. Christmas is worthless. Video games are worthless. Getting drunk is worthless. Getting high. Destroying your marriage over getting drunk and getting high all the time. 
That's happened to me. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you're sacrificing brethren on the altar of whatever sin or worldly fleshliness that you want to hold on to, and you treat that thing as if it's more important than the Word of God. You treat that thing as if it's more important than your fellowship with the brethren. You treat it as if it's life or death. I remember one of my old liberty studies, we, t we titled it, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death! Explanation point. That stuff is just more important. That stuff, that sin, is just more important than your fellowship with the brethren. Okay. Proverbs 18.19. Turn to Proverbs 18.19. Willing to sacrifice brethren on the altar of Christmas. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. The thing about Christmas is, brothers and sisters Christ, it, it's offensive to me. The pagan practices of Christmas are so offensive to me. And I prove that it's not the birth of Jesus Christ. We that stand against, uh, stand against Christmas and stand for the Word of God, we love our Savior, Jesus Christ. We love the story of His birth. We're not the ones that show, show can, uh, dislike to the point of hate for Jesus' birth by adding all this paganism. Okay? I'm offended by Christmas. Yeah. I'm offended by sin. I'm offended by evil. Okay? I'm offended by things that the Bible says is an abomination in the sight of God, like sodomy. I'm offended. And when you offend a brother in Christ... Truly, honestly offend them. Sometimes the truth will offend. Absolutely. If you pre preach absolute truth, that's going to offend brethren. False brethren. Uh, more than anything. I talked about this um, in one of the comments that I made with, uh, that a brother did a Bible study. Um, that what it is, is are they hiding God's word in their heart? How can you test someone who's truly saved or not? By how they react to the word of God. When you back them in a corner with absolute truth, and you call out their sins and their wickedness and doing things the world's way, how do they react? Their love, their so-called love for the scriptures turns into hate. Turns into flat-out hate. Okay? But you can offend a brother in Christ. If I was an alcoholic, and you put alcohol in front of me, you, would, you could offend me. I'm a video game junkie. If you start trying to talk about video games and show how video games are cool and everything, I'm going to be offended. Especially if you know that I gave up video games for the Lord. I want nothing to do with video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows. I gave those up for the Lord. And it comes back down to the same thing with Christmas. When you know, when you know it offends the brethren, then why do you put a Christmas tree behind you purposely when you do Bible studies? To purposely offend the brethren. Yes. Something to think about. The Bible says a brother offended is harder to be won. When you've offended... Brother, I've offended brethren and I've been offended by brethren. I've been on both sides. When I've offended a brethren, I lost a uh, fellowship with the brother in Christ up in Canada. Because I'd said something offensive. I've offended him. I tried to apologize. I tried to win that brother back. And I, and I couldn't do it. You're not supposed to go out of your way to purposely try to offend the brethren. 1 Corinthians 8, 13. We see Paul talking here. He says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Is eating meat a sin? No. But if it offends certain brethren, it's gone. That's Paul's attitude. It's gone. Christmas, no basis in Scripture. It offends more than half the body of Christ that are waking up to the truth. So what do you do? You get rid of it. It's not worth it. Get rid of it. But what do people do? I don't care. I'll just continue purposely offending the brethren. Yeah. Someone once mentioned, he said, bottom line, if all you had a, a brother in Christ that made a comment under one of my channels, uh, channels, one of my videos, bottom line, if all you had is a KJB, King James Bible, if all you had was the Word of God, you would never have learned what Christmas is, nor the pagan practices that come with it. And I'm paraphrasing. He, is, he just basically said you wouldn't have heard of Christmas. You wouldn't have heard about a Christmas tree. 
It's not in here for the birth of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't have heard about Christmas gifts because it's not in here in the birth of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't have heard about Christmas lights. Hello? If this is all you had, you'd had nothing to do with Christmas. And the early Christians had nothing to do with Christmas. When the Catholic Church came out with Christmas to get people to come in and do the, the Mass twice a year, Christmas for wintertime, Easter for uh, uh, springtime to summertime. So winter, I'm sorry, winter. Christmas for winter, if I didn't say it right, and then springtime to uh, summertime was Easter to get them to come in twice a year and do the Mass. Yeah, they're the ones that came up with it and created it. The Bible we read there back there says, Learn not the way of the heathens. Bottom line, Christmas has no basis in Scripture whatsoever. Somebody had to come along, brothers and sisters of Christ, a wolf in sheep's clothing, a false convert, an evil, wicked servant of Satan had to come along and get you to put the Bible down and say, well, there's nothing wrong with doing a Christmas tree. There's nothing wrong with it. And my brother Brian in, in, at King James Video Ministries, he's been deceived. Some wolf in sheep's clothing has come along and deceived somebody who's deceived them, who's passed on the deception. The Bible talks about deceiving and being deceived. And they passed it on to Brian. and he, He's bought a hook, line, and sinker. But if all you had was this, you wouldn't know anything about Christmas. You wouldn't know anything about Christmas at all. Somebody, some evil, wicked, vile servant of Satan had to come along and talk you out of this. And talk you into putting this down. And, keep, and take your eyes off Jesus Christ and put it on the world. I'm pointing out there, putting it on the world. There's the window's right there. I can look out and see the trees and everything. The world. Yeah. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul said, had the attitude that the brethren are more important to me than this world, the ways of this world, the wicked things of this world. And it's more important to me than eating meat. So why is it when Christmas comes around or any, uh, any other thing that brethren are trying to hide under liberty, any other sins, why is it the brethren have the attitude, I can't let it go? I can't. It's life or death. It's life or death. It's life or death. It's my salvation. They, I'm serious. They, it's, I'm starting to look more and more into it. And these brethren out there, they're treating Christmas like that's their salvation. It's not what Jesus did on the cross. It's... Christmas, these pagan practices, if I don't do these every year, I lose my salvation. That's how they act and how they treat us, brothers and sisters of Christ. They're willing to sacrifice us on the altar of Christmas. They'll sacrifice us on the altar of alcohol. They'll sacrifice us on the altar of whatever. The ways of this world is not more important. I believe that at one time, brothers and sisters Christ, at one point when you're studying the scriptures and you get really excited when they're newly saved or God's starting to establish you in the faith, at one point you get so excited for the word of God that God showed you that something wasn't quite right with Christmas through the Holy Ghost. He showed you something's not right with Christmas. Not one person, if you're honest, not one person has ever said, even Brian says at one time he thought Christmas was bad, now he thinks Christmas is okay. Brother Brian at King James Videos. At one point, the Holy Spirit convicted you and said, something's wrong with Christmas. It doesn't line up with Scripture. The pagan practices don't line up with Scripture. And they say they're doing it for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Something doesn't line up. And what happened? Someone came along and talked you out of that conviction. Oh, I'm going to watch a Bible study on how Christmas is okay. And they don't even actually do the Bible study. They don't actually do a Bible study on Christmas. They never have. They just try to tell you that it's okay. But they've never actually done a study on Christ, the term Christmas. Law first mentioned. Where did that come from? The date, Jan uh, December 25th. Who chose that date? Where do we get that date? Jesus wasn't born that day. You acknowledge that. So then who came up with that date? Where did these pagan practices come from? Law first mentioned the Christmas tree. What was the first Christmas tree? How was it used? On and on and on. No, they, they refused to do an actual Bible study on Christmas. Because Christmas is not the birth of Jesus Christ. We've proven that. Right? 
Someone had to come along and talk you out of conviction. There's just no other way to it. There's brethren to this day that are trying to talk me out of conviction. Trying to get me to put down the word of God. Oh, we can just agree to disagree and we can all just get along. Come on, put down your Bible. If you just put down your Bible, brother and sister in Christ, we can all get along. We can all unite if you just put down your Bible. No, I will not put down my Bible. What's happening is, is you're putting down your Bible. If you're not as, if you're not as, after doing the study, if you're not as angry at Christmas and being lied to about Christmas as I am, something's wrong with you. Your heart's not right with the Lord. There's so many things after I got saved, newly saved, and found out this was wrong. The battle building system was wrong. I was taught a false gospel, easy believism, just believe, and you can go do whatever you want. And I did go do whatever I wanted as a false convert. I was a fornicator. I got drunk. Okay, I was playing video games, Hollywood movies, TV shows. I was doing all kinds of wickedness and sin. Why? Because I was taught all you had to do was believe. Believe, only believe. And you now you've got a free pass and you can live like the world and look like the world. Nobody established me in the faith because they didn't want me to be established in the faith. They just wanted you looking like the world, acting like the world, and just claim that you're a Christian. I was lied to about so many things and deceived. I was angry at those people. When I truly got saved and born again, Bible version issue, I was lied to. Oh, you can use whatever Bible you want. They all say the same thing. No, they do not. Oh, it comes from the same place. No, they do not. I was lied to. That should anger you, that you were lied to all those years. I was always taught that Christmas was okay. You were lied to, and you were deceived. It should anger you. But you have brethren that go, nah, I don't care. Not that big of a deal. You need to check your heart with the Lord. Okay. Someone had to come along and talk you out of your conviction. Nah, that's no big deal. No big deal. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not worth losing fellowship with the brethren. Okay? It's worth it in the sense, and I'll say this, it's worth it in the sense that, like I said, I've had to break fellowship with brethren over video games because I know I'm addicted to it. I didn't break fellowship with brethren over Christmas because I'm not addicted to Christmas. It doesn't bother me. I want nothing to do with it. It doesn't bother me. But video games was something that one of the sins that did, I had an addiction to. So when you had brethren that talk about this video game or that video game and, oh, video games are still okay, they're not a big deal, you're gone. I've talked to you about it. I didn't just kick him to the curb right away. I told him, I said, these are evil. This is wicked. God got it out of my life. I don't want the temptation. And that's what you are, is you're a temptation. If you can't get it out of your life, we can't fellowship. And for some brethren out there that were really addicted to, to holidays and the parties and the socialness and everything and the pagan practices that come along with the holidays, if they said, hey, I'm giving up all these holidays for the Lord, they have no basis in Scripture, they're all about elevating the flesh, they're all about me, myself, and I, they're not about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they give those up, and then they have the brother in Christ that sits there and keeps throwing Christmas in their face, Christmas in their face, Christmas in their face, and they've told them, this is evil, this is wicked, it offends me. I don't, I get it. God got it out of my life. I want nothing to do with it. And you keep throwing it in their face, throwing it in their face. That's justification. To, I'm sorry, i got to break fellowship with you. I don't want that temptation. I don't want to be backpedaling. I'm supposed to be moving forward, not going back. Forward. Okay. There are some rare situations like that. That I believe that if, if, well, if at the very end, you've tried to be nice to that brother and sister in Christ and say, listen, this is an addiction I had. I don't want nothing to do with it. It could be something as simple as alcohol. Is it a sin to drink a glass of wine? Well, Peter Reckman has a good study on it where it talks about uh, strong alcohol was only used for medicinal purposes. Medicine. Is it wrong to drink strong alcohol today? Absolutely. Because it was only done for, if you're not sick. If you're doing it for casual drinking and, you know, social out. It is a sin. Okay, wine back in the day was just fermented grape juice. Okay, it wasn't strong alcohol. That was used for medicine. And people would take it and get drunk off of it. Okay.
It's got some good studies on it. But the point is, is a glass of wine, you think a glass of wine is not a big deal. It's just a glass of wine. But when you're putting that glass of wine in front of a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ that used to be a chronic uh, drunkard, trying to use the Bible word, a drunkard, that is offensive. And that is a big deal. Okay. I've already corrected some of the brethren that are pushing Christmas in people's faces knowing that it offends the brethren and that they're wrong for doing it. Okay. Brethren, which brings us to the next thing about division in the body of Christ. There are brethren that are purposely trying to cause division in the body of Christ. Like I said, chapter and verse, I'm all about unity. I'm all about being of one mind and one body. Showing your capital C Christmas is a title for a holy day where God commands us, used to command, because remember, his birth is in the Old Testament, where we're commanded in the Old Testament to keep the birth of Jesus Christ, how to keep it, when to keep it, how to keep it righteously, because I had a brother ask that, what's wrong with me keeping Christmas righteously? And I said, well, can you show me in the scriptures how to keep Christmas righteously? He couldn't say anything back. Why? Because it's not in scripture. That's just another trick that Satan tries to use to get you to put this down and be the final authority and say what is righteous and what's not righteous. And actually got to get that brother to stop and think and go, wait a second. You got a point there, brother. The Bible doesn't tell us, it doesn't even tell us how to keep Christmas in a righteous way. Therefore, you don't keep it at all. Okay? It's not in Scripture. But we, brethren, that say Christmas is evil, sinful, and wicked, get rid of it, we want unity. It's offensive to me. We want unity. The brethren that are coming in and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with Christmas. We have liberty. Oh, we, it's, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. They're the ones causing division. Give it up. It has no basis in Scripture. It's not pleasing to God. Give it up. Why is it so hard? But they're causing division. So turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Brothers and sisters of Christ, there is a falling away, and we see it. And I meant what I said in that study. I, I can't remember. I think it was the one about one day. Where, why does it feel like the body of Christ today can be blown over by a breeze? We're supposed to be standing firm, not fainting, not faltering, striving together. We're supposed to be standing firm. Why does it feel like a, a small breeze comes by and it'll cause us to fall in a heartbeat? Like that. Scatter us to the wind like that. Why is that? Because A, Bible says there's going to be a falling away. Right. And B, the best way you get the brethren to fall away is you get them to put this down. This is no longer our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. One of the biggest tools that Satan uses to destroy men in ministry, you want to know the number one tool that Satan uses? And I've seen it. Pride. I can mention all, you can mention things that I'm doing wrong, and if I have pride, it's only going to make me want to do those things even more and mistreat that brother in Christ that's coming to me to warn me that what I'm doing is wrong. And I've seen it. I've seen it in great men of God. They get so prideful and so puffed up. They're above correction now. They're above accountability. But the Bible said there's going to be a falling away. We're in the last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. Paul talks about you're supposed to run the race as if one receiveth the prize. Granted, at the judgment seat of Christ, everybody's going to have crowns of rewards. But we're supposed to be striving every day as if there's only one reward. Run as if one, only one man receiveth the prize. Okay? We're at the last stretch, brothers and sisters of Christ. The finish line's right there. <laughs> could be next year. It could be the year after that. God knows. I don't. But we're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ is coming every day. And we're supposed to be living like the finish line could be tomorrow, around the corner. That finish line could be around that corner. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep standing. And we've got to keep striving together. But there's going to be a falling away. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. 
Only let your conversations be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh. One capital G God. Stop doing pagan practices where you wind up worshiping false gods. Get rid of the pagan trinity and stick for the Godhead of the King James Bible. All right. The pagan gods of the trinity. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit. What happens when you're doing Christmas or you're inviting, when you invite sin back into your life and pagan practices and idols and false gods, you start inviting all kinds of spirits in. It says one spirit. You're supposed to be capital S spiritually minded, walking after the capital S spirit. And if you're doing that and I'm doing that, we're going to be striving together for the word of God. With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, you know, like I said, somebody has to come along and talk you out of your conviction. Someone has to come along and talk you into putting the Bible down. You get temptations of the flesh that will try to talk you in your flesh will try to talk you into putting your Bible down. Which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Is something godly or is something worldly? For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. The struggles with the flesh. Now that you're here to be in me. He struggles with the flesh and he struggles with the world. If you look at Paul, he lost brothers in Christ by standing, that's suffering for the Lord because he stood for absolute truth. I want to do a study on this eventually, how he corrected Peter, and then he corrected 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and how he corrected, um, I want to get the name right, but sometimes the name Barnabas. How he corrected Barnabas. He lost a brother in Christ. He risked losing a brother in Christ. You're going to suffer for the Lord when you stand for this book, and that will include losing brethren to the world. Losing fellowship with brethren because they're going the way of the world, and you can't go the direction they're going in. We will be doing a study on that. Okay? But the main reason for division in the body of Christ is this. When you get people to put this down, the Word of God. When you get people to add to and subtract from the Word of God. They'll start adding to and subtracting from to mess this book up. And when this book starts getting messed up in your heart, because the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When this starts getting messed up, and you, you see someone changing the Word of God, and it appeals to you, and you're like, well, maybe I don't really need to pick up the Bible as often. Maybe I can just listen to the words of men. Hey, that man, that man, he's a great preacher, great man of God. He changed the Word of God. He added to Scripture and subtracted from Scripture. Oh, it must be okay for me. This is what causes division, brothers and sisters, when you put down the Word of God. This will always divide, like a sword. I got my sword behind me. <laughs> Sword right here behind me. Um, but this will act like a sword and divide. Lies, truth from lies, truly saved from the lost world. This will divide. But you've got brethren that are going to come in and try to take this away from you and get you to start fighting against other brethren and start causing division. I'm all for this. Are you? Well, yes. Then why are we fighting and arguing? Someone brought up a situation where well, there's some things we can agree to disagree. No, there's nothing in the Bible that we can agree to disagree on. And I'll give you an example. The 24 elders. Uh, I have a brother in Christ that believes the 24 elders are two from each of the 12 national boundaries on the Gentile side. Do I believe that? No. When I look at the Bible, I realize there's 24 national boundaries. I, I kind of like to believe that the 24 elders are one from each of the national boundaries. There's 12 national boundaries on the Jews' side. There's 12 national boundaries on the Gentile side. So you've got 24, that's 24 elders. You can't have two masters. You can't have two Gentiles over the, over the same boundary and representing the same boundary. You know what I'm saying? You have one, not two. But here's the thing. 
it's not something we can agree to disagree on because we don't know. When I teach my theory, it's just my, I, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. So there is nothing to agree to disagree on. Brian, you, Brother Brian at King James Fitting Ministries, a brother in Christ, he did a good teaching on what he thought was the 12, is two from the 12 national boundaries of the Gentile side. And he used to be like, this is just a theory. I don't know. Okay, I don't know. It's when you start taking those things and saying, now this is absolute truth when it's not absolute truth, that's when you're starting to cause division. Okay? It's not absolute truth. What, what I believe about the 12, 24 elders, it's not absolute truth. Why? Because the Bible doesn't come out and spell out and tell us exactly who the 24 elders are. So it's only going to be speculation until we get caught up and get to see who those 24 elders are. So why is there any, there's no fighting over it. You see what I'm saying? It's not something we can agree to disagree on because the Bible doesn't flat out tell us who they are. And they'll bring something up that and say, see, there's something we can agree to disagree. No, it isn't. We don't know. We'll find out when we get there. Okay? And they'll bring up other situations like that when it comes to things that pertain to what's going on in heaven, what's going on in the time of Jacob's trouble, what's going on in the thousand-year reign. That's not our dispensation. There's some things we're not going to understand. We'll find out when we get to heaven and we get to watch everything play out in the, thousand, or the time of Jacob's trouble. We'll truly understand everything, what's going on in a thousand years when we're there. Okay, when we got the mind of Christ, we get rid of this wicked body and get to put on an incorruptible body and we have the mind of Christ. Then we'll all understand. Okay. Which brings me down back to this. It's like, I was asking, I said, Lord, is there only one way to unite the brethren? Sometimes I believe we're so close, we're so close to that finish line. We're so close to the catching away of the body of Christ. That falling away, we're getting to the point where it's down here. There's fewer and fewer Christians that are still standing where this is 100% their foundation. We got brethren where it's 98%. We got brethren where they're 90%. We got brethren that are there 50%. We got brethren that have basically, this Bible is set in their gathering dust. But they're saved. They got saved off of the true plan of salvation. At one point, this used to be 100% their foundation at one point. But over time, somebody's come along and whispered in their ear, and they slowly put this Bible down. Is there only one way to unite the brethren? If you turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 7. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Now, good works, is it, am I the authority on what's considered a good work and what's not? No. What's the authority on what's a good work and what's not a good work? Hello? I shouldn't say that, sorry, forgive me. I think it should, to us, brother, I'm talking to brother and sister Christ, I've been saved for a while. This should be a no-brainer. Hello, this, this is our foundation in all matters of faith and practice. So that's why I'm saying hello, you know, and I need to stop being sarcastic. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness. Uncorruptness. I've been accused of lying against liberty when the person who's accusing me of lying against liberty, they're the ones that are corrupting the doctrine of true liberty in the Bible. It's what God did for us on the cross. That's what gave us the liberty from the consequences. All the things the Bible talks about liberty, we'll go over it real quick, liberty is you have the law of sin and death. We can sin as a Christian and still go to heaven. Are we supposed to sin as Christians? No. Are we to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we the dead to sin living any longer therein? Okay, Paul even warns, we're not supposed to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Just because you can sin doesn't mean you're supposed to. You're supposed to fight sin. You're supposed to put the flesh down now that you're saved. And the other liberty that it's talking about, which still falls under the law of sin and death, but it has to do with the Levitical laws. There was Levitical laws that if you broke those laws, you lost your salvation. We're no longer under the Levitical laws. We have liberty. It's about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Not about what we do to save us. I can't save myself. But you have someone coming in and they're corrupting the doctrine 
of what true liberty is in the Bible. Oh, it's just a choice. It's just a choice. We all get to choose. It's just choice. That's not what the Bible talks about doctrine or about the uh, liberty. Uh, gravity, sincerity, okay? In doctrine, we're supposed to show uncorruptedness. We're supposed to be gravity. We're supposed to be firm. A firm foundation. This is the foundation for our doctrine. We're supposed to be firm in it. That's what gravity is. Sincerity. We're supposed to be sincere. We're not supposed to be mocking. We're not supposed to be um, sarcastic. We're supposed to be preaching it in sincerity and in truth. We're saying sound speech. Like I said, if you're mocking or being sarcastic, that's not sound speech. I failed it. And I'm, I'm hitting this man right here first. You know, if I could, I'd smack myself up that. Stop the mocking. Stop the, the sarcasticness. And the one of the deceptions that go on today is we have brethren that are deceived by somebody who comes along and tells them, didn't you know Jesus was also mocking and being sarcastic? And he wasn't. I put that challenge out there. I said, by Bible definition of what mocking is, can you show me where Jesus mocked once in his earthly ministry? By definition. And I said, go back and listen to e uh, Elijah when he's talking to the priest of Baal. That's mocking. When did Jesus do that? Chapter and verse. Jesus had sound speech. He spoke in sincerity and in truth. He spoke with gravity, with authority. Remember? He spoke as one with authority and not as the scribes. He wasn't out there mocking and back-talking, which is kind of what, uh, what I'm starting to think. When you're being sarcastic, it's actually mouthing off. Lip it's, that's what sarcasm is. You're being sarcastic towards somebody. To you're mouthing off towards that person or those group of people, whatever you're talking about. Okay. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. If you're... If you're not a doctrine showing no uncorruptness in the doctrine, your gravity, I'm firm in this foundation, with sincerity and sound speech, you can't be condemned by God and by the brethren. The lost world, of course, they're always going to keep trying to condemn you, always keep trying to condemn you. But the one that matters, our Savior, our Lord, our King, our friend, Jesus Christ. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. I start feeling shame when God brought this to me. And we start, I started reading it and studying it. It's like, I have been doing some mocking. I have been mouthing off. And I need to stop doing that. I should be ashamed. Right. Having no evil thing to say of you. That goes back to sanctification. That also goes back to not being double-minded. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It goes back to not being a hypocrite. Okay. Brethren, I gave up things for the Lord. If I fall back into them, and I'm struggling with them, and I give them back up again, uh, praise the Lord for getting them back out of my life. But if I'm doing those same things, and I'm just vehemently condemning somebody else, and I'm doing those same things, that makes you a hypocrite. Okay. And that gives reason for people to speak evil of you. If you say that, you know, Halloween is evil and wicked and pagan, and Easter is evil, wicked, and pagan, and then you turn around and you say Christmas is Christian and it's a Christian holiday and everything, it's like, how do you think people are going to react, react to that? It's all pagan. Okay, they'll have something evil to say of you, and they'll be right. Nine, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. And to please them well in all things, not answering again. Talking about for today, we talk about with your jobs. Okay, you need to be obedient to your jobs as long as it doesn't go against the word of God. Okay, well, I can only I could wash this this car once and it looks great, but my boss says I have to wash it three times. Then you wash it three times. But it's just a waste of time. It doesn't matter. Okay, be obedient to your own masters. Oh, he wants me to write down everything, and we only need this information, but he wants me to write down all this stuff. It's your boss. Be obedient. As long as it doesn't go against the scriptures and against the word of the Lord, be obedient. Verse 10, not purloining, 
but showing all good fidelity, you know, being a good hard worker, not not lack, uh, being lazy, and find, your boss finds you standing around a lot instead of working hard. Right? That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, all things. That they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You don't have a personal life anymore as a, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. There is no, I can separate um, ministry life from family life and, and everything. There is no, I can have my Christian life here and then I can still have some of my private life over here, the sins and everything. No, in all things. Verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. How do you think you can, you're going to be able to lead your boss to, to Christ? Because he's supposed to see Jesus in you. You're supposed to be a hard worker. Yes, sir, I'll do this. Yes, sir, I'll do that. Oh, sir, I was able to get this done in half an hour instead of 45 minutes. Praise the Lord. He hears you giving God glory for everything. Giving God thanks for everything. Okay, we're supposed to be a light to the world by the life that we live. Today, especially today, in these last days... We're heading for the finish line, okay? The catching away of the body of Christ is just around the corner. In these last days, the profession of faith, there's so many fakes and frauds out there. How are we going to be a real light for Jesus Christ? By the life that you live for Jesus Christ. This being your foundation, all matters of faith and practice. Standing against wickedness, the things that the world loves. The whole world loves video games. The whole world loves... Christmas. The whole world loves getting drunk. The whole world, you stand against this stuff and say, hey, I'm a Bible believing, God fearing man. That Christmas, well, you, you, I thought Christians, saw, that Christmas has nothing to do with my birth of my Savior. It's pagan, it's Catholic, I want nothing to do with it. You be a light into the world. You don't try to, you don't start blending in and compromising and looking like the world and, and doing the things that the lost world does, becoming part of the rudiments of the world. Twelve, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, ungodliness, Christmas is ungodly, and worldly lust, how do they get people to celebrate Christmas? They appeal to the lusts of the flesh. They appeal to your flesh. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Okay, I want to read that. This present world. What causes division and messes up, brethren, when, is when you take God and His perfect written word, word out of the equation. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We're supposed to be set apart from this world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're set apart. But how do you get people to turn their back on that? To stop living soberly, to stop living righteously, to stop living godly. You get them to put the Bible down. And it's no longer, thus saith the Lord, it's thus saith my preferences, my feelings and opinions, my emotions. Yeah. Titus 2.13. Let's keep reading. Looking for that blessed hope. Remember what I asked? I said, what was, what's the only way to unite brethren in these last days? And sometimes it feels like this is going to be the only way to unite the brethren in, the last day, in these last days. Looking for that blessed hope. Notice it says looking. It's a present tense, what you're doing right now. Looking. We are supposed to be looking for the coming of Jesus Christ to come back any day now. The Bible says so. And you've got brethren that have turned their back on that. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking. Present tense. There's no getting around that scripture, that verse right there. Present tense, we're supposed to be looking. And I've taught you, brothers and Christ, you don't stand there, even though I like doing it sometimes. I like when the sun comes out. I can see the clouds. I like sitting on the deck and talking with the Lord for hours in prayer. Listening to the Bible being read by Alexander Scoria as I sit on the deck and I just look up. But true looking for that blessed hope is an action. How you're living your life. That determines whether you're looking for that blessed hope. Are you living for Jesus Christ every day? Are you fighting hard to get that sanctification done? Complete. 
It never will be complete, but you have that attitude. How often do you walk through the house and say, Lord, is there anything bad and evil and wicked in this home that I need to get rid of? Is there something I'm doing I'm not supposed to be doing that doesn't please you, Lord? Lord, am I staying in the Bible? Am I staying in your word? Am I getting distracted by this world? Am I getting distracted by personal things that, that are pulling me away from you? There are some things that aren't a sin, but they can still pull you away from the Lord. If this is pulling me away from you, Lord, it's gone. How we look for that blessed hope is determined by how you live. Because there's men out there that will say, will read this verse and say, You praise the Lord Jesus to come back any day. And you look at them and they're the most wicked, foul, worldly person. They look like the world, act like the world. They don't, they're, they're lying to you. They don't believe in the, they're not looking for that blessed hope. They're not looking for it. Why? Because your words and your deeds need to line up. And you can be so deceived by people's words. That's why the Bible says, by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. God had to teach me, sometimes the hard way, had to teach me that it's not just words, it's also deeds. They both need to line up. If pagan practices and pagan holidays are evil, then they're all evil. You don't get to pick and choose what pagan holiday you want to keep. Evil is evil. Okay. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He's going to redeem us someday, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're all looking forward to that. But here's the thing. When he comes back, how is he going to find you? Is he going to find you caving in? Remember what we said? I want to try to see if I can find my part here, spot here. <laughs> right. Is he going to find this being 98% of your foundation? Is he going to come back and find this 70% of your foundation? 60? Perhaps 50? 40? 30? 20? 10? Or is he going to come back and find this 100% your foundation? Is he going to come back with you standing... By the time you hit 50, this is 50% of your foundation, you're falling flat on your face. Big time. But you're, you're in the process of falling on your face when you start dropping down to even 98%. This is only 98% of your foundation. How is God going to find you when he comes back? He's going to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Are you zealous of good works? Oh yeah, I'm zealous of good works. I I I, I vacuum the the I vacuum the building, the I back, the church building, and I take care of the lawn. I'm zealous of good works, and I do chapter and verse. Oh, I celebrate Christmas every year. Chapter and verse. Oh, I'm doing this for the Lord. Chapter and the verse. It always comes back to this. Is this 100% your foundation? When it says zealous of good works, who's the authority on what's a good work and what's not? My Lord and Savior through His perfect written word. Not me. Not you. Not other men that are standing up there in ministry and trying to act like they're the final authority. And they're not. God is always the final authority. He's the one who decides whether that's a good work or not. And He'll let us know. He does, and that's, what's so, that's what I love about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He doesn't leave us tossing in the wind. He doesn't leave us ignorant. He's given us the word of truth. He's shown us the truth. Okay. Satan loves leaving his people, his minions, the people that serve him, in the dark. Our God, Lord and Savior, doesn't keep us in the dark. There's some things about the future we don't know, but present tense, he doesn't leave us in the dark. He tells us to trust him. We might not know what happens tomorrow, but right here, right now, I can trust the Lord 100%. And I need to trust Him. The hard part is trusting Him in the future. What's going to be happening in the future? But when it comes to being zealous of good works, God will tell us what those good works are. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Be not drunken. Don't fornicate. You're supposed to have sound speech. You're not supposed to be cussing. You're not supposed to be mocking. Being sarcastic, you're supposed to have sound speech. And so on and so forth. Okay. You're not supposed to have idols in your life, false idols, false gods. You're not supposed to be going the way of the heathens. 
You're supposed to be doing things according to the, reading your Bible every day. These are good works because the Bible says, pray without ceasing. The Bible says, 2 Timothy 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Okay, we're to study to show thyself approved unto God. Those things are in the scriptures. God will tell us what good works are. He won't leave us hanging. He won't just say, I want you to do good works and then leave, and then won't tell us what those good works are. We've got to figure it out on our own. If we had to figure it out on our own, we're in a big mess, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're in a huge mess. Verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. All authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay. It says, looking for that blessed hope. How do we do verse 15? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. I'm sorry. How do we do verse 15 where it says, Let no man despise thee. Let no man despise thee. By speaking these things and exhorting and rebuking with all authority. This is our authority. And when it's talking about let no man despise thee, it's talking about brethren. The fact that I have brethren that despise me because I'm against Christmas, because the Bible's against Christmas, Makes me wonder. Okay. The lost world despises me because I call out their sin and tell them that they need Jesus Christ. This sword divides. But how do you keep from uh, men, brethren despising you? Right here, sound speech. We talked about it. You have to have sound speech. I've seen brethren that they get frustrated at another brother in Christ because they're, they're mocking and they're being sarcastic. And what that does is that offends a brethren. And what happens? They could be preaching truth. They could be preaching absolute truth. But if they do it mockingly and sarcastically, it offends a brother in Christ that you're trying to correct. And they put that shield up. And what do we read? A brother, uh, Proverbs 18.9, A brother is offended. It's harder to be one than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle, you just close that door to reach that brother of Christ for that correction that we're reading there, the exhort and rebuke. Okay, that's why you have to use sound speech. So no man despises you. You don't offend people. You're not supposed to go around purposely offending people. The truth will do that enough. The truth will do that enough, brothers and sisters of Christ. All right. So what's going on here that we're talking about, okay? Just doing a conclusion on the Christmas studies, I'm done. I've got my Christmas studies out there, they're going to stay. I was actually wanted you guys to see the truth. So I actually did the study on the origins of the term Christmas. I did the study on the origins of the date for Christmas, where did it come from. We did an origin on, we did a Bible study on a tree decked with gold and silver, where they are bringing in pagan practices, like for Christmas, and they're decking a tree, taking it from its natural state, like Christmas, and they're worshiping it. Okay, you say, well, I'm not worshiping it. Yes, you are. At this point, if you've watched all my studies, and the studies on liberty, one day, the true story, the day of Jesus' birth and everything, and you still put up that Christmas tree, you're worshiping that Christmas tree. You're not putting this first. You're putting yourself first. And you're worshiping that Christmas tree at this point. Okay? We've talked about these things. Uh, how they appeal to the flesh. When worst case scenario comes around, they're just going to appeal to the flesh. When this isn't on their side, and it isn't, they're going to appeal to the flesh. When I called out a brother in Christ, well, I thought he was a brother in Christ, I called him out, he was playing a very wicked, vile video game. Vampires, werewolves, uh, uh, Satanism, false god worship, and mostly dressed women, sodomy. It was just a very vile, wicked game. And what they do? They came back and started calling me names. Oh, you're a liberalist. You're, you're just a liberty thief. You're a liberalist. Why? Because they couldn't handle this. And all I did was quote scripture to them. I quoted one scripture. Then I told this before in the past. Then, I, then they started yelling at me. Quote another scripture. Then they started yelling at me. I quote another scripture. Then they started calling me names and putting me down. It's like they have had such a hate for God's word. Such a taste, distaste for God's word. And in the future, they fell away and went their own way. They're, they're, they didn't love this. 
This wasn't their final authority, 100% authority. And they proved it. Brothers and sisters of Christ, stop sacrificing brethren on the altar of Christmas. Stop sacrificing brethren on the altar of any sin out there. We need to come together and strive together. And the only way we're going to do this is if this is our final authority. 100%. Not 98%. 100%. And brethren, we're going to get into the armor of God, back into the armor of God. Because I'm noticing, brethren, that I care about mentors that are putting, they're slowly taking off the armor of God. They're not putting on the whole armor of God every day. They're taking it off. They've taken the helmet off. The sword goes down. It's starting to get dull. They're no longer comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. What's going on? We're in the last days, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're in the last days. Okay. Now, I'm going to wrap this up with this, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm going to leave uh, my P.O. box and my um, email address and the description and I'm going to leave the door open you want to talk to me about the Word of God through the Word of God this is hundred percent our authority so we can be strived together with one mind by all means email me by all means write me letters okay if you still want to talk on the subject of Christmas I'm here I'm not going to close the doors and I'm not going to just kick you to the curb like you're nothing because you disagree with me but remember we use this when we talk not the flesh, not the flesh. <laughs> some, okay, this is not the final authority. This is the final authority. You want to have fellowship and you want to talk about the scriptures and you can prove where I'm wrong, which nobody has. I'm not doing this to brag. They haven't proved me wrong. They haven't proved the scriptures wrong. I need to say it right. You can prove me wrong. I can be wrong. I can be fallible. But my teachings on liberty, my teachings on Christmas... Nobody is able to show me in the scriptures where I'm wrong. Okay? All they can do is attack me personally and yell at me. Shut up! You're, you're a Pharisee! You're, you're this! You're that! Name calling everything! Why? Because this isn't their final authority. Because if it was, they'd be like, you know what? You're right. Christmas is gone. The brethren are more important. The body of Christ is more important. We're in the last days. We need to be standing together and striving together. And this Christmas is causing division. It's gone. It's not worth it. It's gone. The ones that are holding on to it, they're the ones causing division. Right. So prayer and testimonies, uh, 2018.outlook.com. I'll put that down. The um, I also have Skype. Uh, right now, I'm still on YouTube, just on uh, YouTube, um, of course I'm on YouTube. Um, Facebook, I'm on Facebook because I talk to a, a brother in Christ on Facebook, and I also talk to my daughter through the video chat on Facebook. So you can probably catch me on Facebook if you want to, um, but I, I like to use Skype because eventually I am going to, my daughter turns 18 and she's going the way of the world, I'm going to keep praying for her and try to be part of her life. But I'm, I'm just so close to getting rid of Facebook. I really am. I'm getting tired of Facebook. Um, it's, it keeps coming up and trying to push movies on me. Like you'll have a, a tab that keeps saying, you've got all these things you're missing out on. you got to click on it. And it goes through and people are putting up videos of movies, video games, whatever. And it's just temptation. And it's like, I'm getting tired of YouTube and their censorship. They've made me take down a few videos or they'll block the videos so you can't see them. Um... So, yeah, but that right now is still a door, though. It hasn't closed yet. So, if you email me and you want a video chat, I, love, I, I prefer going through the scriptures with brethren face-to-face, -face, <laughs> even if it's a video chat, versus uh, emails. I mean, emails allow me to put my words together a lot easier because you got time to sit there and study the Bible and, and put scriptures. What about this scripture? It's kind of like putting together Bible studies sometimes when I put together emails for the brethren. But I just want you to know, I'm not going to slam the door shut in your face. Because I'm not your enemy, okay? Your flesh is your enemy. The world is your enemy. I'm not your enemy. I'm pointing you to absolute truth. I'm pointing you to Jesus Christ. I'm trying to strive together, okay? I'm not going to kick you to the curb. I'm not going to stab you in the back. I, see, I hear that there's a lot of whispering and a lot of backbiting going on among the brethren. And some leaders... And some of the elders are
or behind some of the whispering and the backbiting. What we have? Okay. I'm here. Uh, the P.O. Box, it's P.O. Box 4293, Brookings, Oregon, 97415. 97415. My, I keep praying to the Lord, I'd love to have, have a house church here in Oregon. It's just, it just seems like there's only very few, and I have one brother in Christ that's two and a half hours away, um, but there's just, there's nobody here in, in the area. There's nobody within an hour drive that I would drive an hour. I didn't almost drive two hours to be part of a, a house church once a week. Um, but there's just, there's, I, there's, I haven't come across another Bible-believing, God-fearing man um, in the state of Oregon other than my uncle. I mean, I think I, I saw someone was mentioning someone that lived a little bit north of, was a brother in Christ, I think, lived a little bit north of, um, oh, my brain freezes sometimes on names. Uh, Roseburg, there's past Roseburg, and then there's another city there, and it's a little bit north of there. Not quite Portland yet. Um, so there might, I know, I know there might be some other brethren that live here in Oregon, but my, my, one of the things, like I said, what's going to cause us to unite? I think one of the things that will help the body of Christ is if we start coming together and forming house churches. I think that will be a big, big thing that will help the body of Christ big time. It means that you're no longer a one-man show. And I'm talking about anybody. If, you're, if I'm sitting in my house by myself and I'm watching Bible studies and everything, and I'm, I'm a one-man show. We're supposed to be coming together, striving together, working together. And I think the best way to do that is to get back into doing house churches. So if there's a group of you in an area that you know that are brothers and sisters in Christ, you need to start coming. Even if it means you come together to watch a video of a Bible study that someone else does, and then after the study you guys turn it off and you talk about it among the body of Christ there, and you fellowship, and you get prayer requests, you hold people physically accountable face to face, okay? Hopefully God will raise someone up in that group that you get to do more where someone's preaching. You know, God will lift somebody up, a man, a young man, and get him in ministry and whatnot. But I think one of the biggest ways that will help unite the body of Christ today where they're not just blowing, being tossed to and fro, you know, with every wind of doctrine, the world, um, is house churches. It really is. I think that's one way. But part of me believes that we are definitely hardcore and the last days of the falling away where that tree is flaming, slamming down and people are starting to put down this book or this book is no longer 100% their authority and they're starting to go the ways of the world and the only way, the only way it feels like, and I, if I can get an amen, if I'm not the only one that feels this way, sometimes I feel the only way the body of Christ is going to be 100% united, standing together, is the catching away of the body of Christ. Things are so messed up today. And I'm trying, and I'm fighting the good fight, and there's other brethren out there that are fighting the good fight. Brothers and sisters in Christ, keep fighting, keep standing for the truth, and keep learning from your mistakes. Okay, humble yourselves. I mean, I see brethren preaching on humbleness, and yet they're, they're, they have pride in them as they're preaching humbleness. And it's like, is that where we've gotten? Is that where we're at right now? that brethren are preaching that, you know, you need to apologize when you're wrong, and they're wrong, and they refuse to apologize, but they're trying to preach that the brethren need to apologize when they're wrong. It's like, is that where we're gotten? Have we fallen so much? Brother, I just, I pray all the time that the Lord for the body of Christ. Lord, please strengthen the body of Christ. Bring them back to their first love. Have them come back to this being their final foundation. Open the eyes of those that are, being, they're starting to be blinded by the truth, by the lost world, and they're blinded from the truth. They're starting to turn their backs on stands that they once took. Jesus could come back any day. This is our foundation on matters of faith and practice. It's thus saith the Lord, not thus saith my preferences. But now they're putting this to the side, and it's thus saith my preferences. Now I'm not looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back any day now. We have people that are slowly falling away. There's the big falling away, but I'm seeing more and more of the falling away. Brothers and sisters in Christ, my, like I said, my door is open. Please send me a letter, email, send me a letter. Uh, if you end up getting up, Skype is a video. If you don't know what Skype is, Skype is a video program where you can talk and visually see each other. So even if you don't have a camera, if you've got a mic on a controller, you can still talk to another brother in Christ. You know, kind of like the phone, only you're doing it through the internet. 
but the main point of Skype is to be able to video chat so you can see one another. Um, you know, be there for one another through the, through the tears and through the smilings and the laughter. Okay, the joy that God gives us. Okay. Uh, we're going to end with this. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Sorry this was so long. It was just supposed to be a conclusion. But Proverbs chapter 3. Not Psalms, but Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 5. This is the best encouragement I can give you for right now, Lord, uh, brethren. That's why I tell the Lord, Lord, share it with me, I'm sharing it with you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. With what's going on, you can easily get distracted by the world. With all these things that Satan's trying to use to divide, to divide the brethren, he brings in pagan holidays. He brings in pagan practices. He brings in sinful lusts of the flesh. Video I, I couldn't believe video games caused division. I can't believe that that would cause division, but it did. It caused division in the body of Christ. I could not believe that someone who claimed to love Jesus as much as they did would destroy their marriage and choose drunkenness and getting high and getting very fleshly while they were doing that, that they would choose that over their marriage. Okay. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. If it's about me being the final authority, I am in up to here in cow manure. I'm not the final authority. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways, in all thy ways. You don't have your own personal life on the side in your Christian life. They're not separate. Either you're 100% a Christian and in all thy ways acknowledge Him, or you're lost. You can still fail the Lord, but I'm talking about your heart's desire. It says here, trust the Lord with all thine heart. It's a heart issue. Your heartfelt desire should be to want to acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When someone comes to you and says, hey, what you're doing there, it has no basis in scripture. And actually, when you look into the history, the Catholic Church created it. And you know, there's a lot of paganism in it, false god worship in it. And you really need to get rid of it. Are you trusting the Lord with all thy heart? Is your heartfelt attitude, oh, if it has nothing to do with the scriptures, it's not pleasing to God, I'm getting rid of it. I want all my ways to acknowledge Him. Everything that I do to please God. And He shall direct thy paths. Verse 7. Be not wise in thine own eyes. I'm, that starts with me, brother, says Christ. I tell you, Lord, am I putting my personal feelings into this? Or is this what your word's saying? Be not wise in your own eyes. Christmas has no basis in Scripture. It's not about our Lord and Savior's birth. It is not. That's deception. That's lies. Be not wise in your own eyes. There's men standing there acting like they're so wise, justifying Satanism. Same thing with the video games. Be not wise in your own eyes. Same thing with the drunkenness. Getting high. Satanic style music cussing, whatever. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. You know what keeps you from departing from evil? You're not fearing the Lord anymore. One of the things I brought up, I said, I, I just, it, it was just hard for me to, I, I still to this day don't get it. There's brethren that I love and care about. I know they're saved. But you look at them, and they're, when they, they're not fearing the Lord like they used to. They're not fearing the Lord like they used to. And what happens? They start inviting evil in. Or they continue in evil when it's pointed out to them that that's evil. They won't depart from it. They won't give it up. Brothers and sisters in Christ, trust the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil.
I so desperately want the body of Christ to be one again and united. But we're so much under attack, brothers and sisters of Christ. We've got wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, pretending to be one of us. And you've got false converts coming in. Oh, I'm one of you. And they're messing. They're trying to scatter the flock. They're trying to mess Christians up. And we're fighting this fight so hardcore to stand firm for what is right. And it makes it even harder when you have truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing men going and women going the way of these false converts, of these wolves in sheep's clothing, being led astray. And you get brothers and sisters in Christ you love with all your heart turning on you and kicking you to the curb like you're nothing. Brother says, Christ, we're in the last days. We're in the last days. Please, please, please. If you realize that you're one of those 98%, 70%, 60%, 50%, and you're falling flat on your face, repent. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily and get back to this being 100% your foundation. Get back to this being that your heartfelt desire is to please God and all that you do. Not your flesh, God. I want us to be one, brother, says Christ. I just don't think it's going to happen until the catching away of the body of Christ. But I do believe one of the things that might help us is if we start forming house churches again. Where we come together physically. This all being so separated, if it means moving somewhere where there's a house church and brethren, worst case scenario, you might have to move. I've, I've been willing to move. Okay. I've been willing to move clear across the United States to the other half side of the United States. I've been willing to move. So, you got my email. I'm going to put it in the description. The P.O. Box number, if you want to write letters. Um, and then, like I said, eventually, if you want to start emailing me and you want to get connected on Skype. I, like I said, I'm on Facebook where you can still do the video chat program through Facebook. And you want to start doing some Bible studies because you disagree with me. You still vehemently disagree. After everything I've shown you, not good enough. You still disagree with me with Christmas and you want to talk to me about the scriptures. Or you want to talk to me about just things you do agree with me on. The door is open. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm done with all the videos on Christmas. We're going to move on to some things. We might still talk about liberty here and there. We might still talk about holy days, Sabbath days, new moons. We might talk about ordinances. One of the studies i got coming up is going to be about what's really going on in all the, the uh, Pauline epistles when it comes to liberty about what's going on. you got the Jews coming in and... What Jesus did on the cross isn't good enough. you got to keep the law. you got to get circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. And they're messing up everything that Paul's doing. So we're still going to talk about some of that stuff. But Christmas, I've got the studies. You still want to do Christmas knowing that it might cost you fellowship with the brethren, that you're going to offend the brethren because you're choosing wickedness and sin. You've got free will. God gave you free will. I'm not gonna, I can't stop you. I can only warn you with night and day with tears, but I can't stop you from actually continuing wickedness and sin. You're just going to fall away, and I'm just going to be praying for you that God will pick you back. You'll, you will allow God to pick you back up. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.